staff that's here, Shunya Mion, which is very exciting. And uh, I'm also a clinical assistant professor at Turo College of Osteopathic Medicine, where we're doing some really interesting things. The thing that we're going to talk about today is candida hypersensitivity and autoimmunity. And just as a show of hands, how many of you have heard of candida before? Oh, yeah. quite a few of you. So I hope you're going to really get a lot of information because in a lot of ways, this has been considered a mysterious condition and a lot of controversy over the years. And I think it's fully coming to the light right now. Now, I really like this New Yorker cartoon because I think it says something what's going on in the state of our world today. And if you look at the upper left box, when I was in college back in the 70s, dating myself, if I wanted to use a computer, I had to go to a room and put in a card. It was quite huge. It was like a huge wall unit. Then a few years later, uh, if you look to the box in the top right, by the time I was in medical school in the 80s, you know, the computers were the size of a TV set. The old TV sets, by the way, not those big plasma screen ones. Uh, and then as things advanced, if you look at the bottom lower um, the left box, by the time I was teaching the medical students, they were all sitting in the audience like you were with a laptop and taking their notes and, and doing all their, and all the PowerPoints were on there. And finally, what I think is gonna happen pretty soon is that in the bottom right, we're gonna be plugged in to the computer and all the information is gonna be coming out that way. So that's how technology works, right? It just keeps on getting more and more advanced. But my question is, why doesn't the same thing happen in medicine? Why is it that in medicine, it can take decades for us to change our thinking about why something occurs? And you know, one of the best examples of that is aspirin. I mean, it took 18 years for doctors to finally say, yes, that's a good thing to take to help prevent a reoccurrence of a heart attack. And, um, you know, so I think this slide about medicine advances one funeral at a time until the, the guys in charge, you know, unfortunately leave this world, it takes a while, unlike technology. So back to Canada, you know, our topic today. And Canada has been shrouded in mystery and disbelief. Uh, many of my conventional allopathic uh, physicians do not believe in it. And I do understand a little bit why. A lot of them don't like the fact that there can be so many symptoms associated with one condition. Doctors just don't like that. <laughs> they like it very cut and dry. Doctors also don't like if there's not a single test that proves the diagnosis. And, and finally, I think also doctors really were confused. I get this all the time in my practice. They're like, Candida only can happen if you have AIDS, or maybe if you've got a good had chemotherapy for cancer. But I think I'm going to show you, and many of you may know this already, that that's not true. And, and that, but getting the doctors to, you know, un, come to this new understanding takes a lot. And one of the doctors who actually um, brought up this whole idea was Dr. Oren Truss, who back in the 80s was seeing patients that had what he described as a candida syndrome. So what's changed now in 2019 that wasn't you know, 10, 20 years ago you know, when candida was doing so um, malign? And the real difference is our understanding of the microbiome. Now all of a sudden doctors are realizing that this balance of good and bad bacteria, yeast, and even viruses in our body determines our overall health. And most importantly, a lot of this action of the microbiome is going on in the intestines. What else has changed? Fortunately for myself and other physicians, that functional medicine as a specialty has really come into its own. And we do have to thank some of the superstars in the field. Dr. Mark Hyman and Dr. David Perlmutter are extremely well known. They're uh, on TV a lot. They uh, have a very high profile, but they've also written some best-selling books. And I think they've really led the way in trying to promote how this whole idea of gut health, balancing your microbiome can be a key to living a healthy life. 
Let's take a moment and go to celiac disease. Dr. Osborne actually earlier spoke about that, and I think it actually is a very important example because it's one of those areas where we can merge these conventional doctors with the holistic doctors and have some kind of you know, meeting of the minds. Um, celiac disease, you know, again, for many, many years, was thought to be a very rare condition. Uh, now we know it's like one in 300 of the population. The whole idea of gluten avoidance, you know, for many years, I mean, we're starting to get this now, it was like a farce. Oh, this one person's got a gluten intolerance, you know, uh, let's pick out a, a restaurant where he can eat or something like that. Now, you can't go anywhere and get gluten, it's impossible. <laughs> um, so this was really, I think, the first disease where doctors were starting to realize diet could have a dramatic impact, and it was a lot more prevalent than anybody ever even realized. And the other thing, really interesting thing I want to point out is that celiac was also one of the first diseases where we saw so many different presentations. And that's what I wanted to keep in mind. Because when I was in medical school, they had a page or two in your pediatric textbook. Um, this was celiac disease. It was a pediatric disease. The children typically presented with distended abdomen. They had abdominal pain. They um, they were, had poor growth from mineral and vitamin deficiencies, and of course would have chronic diarrhea. But this was who had celiac disease, not an adult, uh, you know, not other presentations. Again, what changed with celiac disease? Dermatologists started to describe rashes that they were finding mainly in celiac disease patients. This particular rash is called dermatitis herpetiformis. It is not a herpes rash, it just looks like a herpes rash because it has these vesicles, but again, it was being seen in these patients on celiac disease and would go away when the patients went off of gluten. So the, the other fascinating thing, which again, even the dermatologists today don't really fully comprehend this, that all of a sudden now a gut disease is causing skin rashes. Again, this is becoming more commonplace and accepted, but for many years it was like, there's no connection between your stomach and getting a skin rash, as we know with food allergies. So this, look, celiac disease also did something very important. Dr. Alessandro Fasano, who was originally in Maryland, is now at Harvard, was this brilliant Italian gastroenterologist, actually pediatric gastroenterologist, who started to describe this phenomenon of leaky gut. So what is leaky gut? Well, we all have in our intestine a one cell line thickening, thickening of, the, of the intestine. Like whereas in your skin, you have seven layers. So it has to be very protective so you don't get an infection through your skin. So in the gut, you have one cell layer thin. What happens when there's inflammation in that intestine, whether it's from gluten, if you have celiac disease, if it's from other things I'm gonna discuss about in a moment, what happens is, if you can see on the slide, the cells start to separate. And that allows bacteria, yeast, certain food proteins that are in the intestinal lumen to get into the bloodstream where they're really not supposed to be. And this again, you'll hear is sort of that connection with autoimmunity. So why focus on candida? Why is candida the, the big bad condition? Well, it seems to be one of the, the more prevalent ones. And I think to me also, it's one of the most classic microbiome disorders right now. And candida, as you should know, is a fungi. Um, and it's found in many areas of the body. It's found on your skin. It's found in your sinuses. I see a lot of patients with chronic sinusitis due to candida. Um, it's found obviously in the vaginal area. There are many women who go to gynecologists repeatedly for chronic vaginitis. And of course, it's in the intestinal tract. And it's supposed to be there, but it's supposed to be there in a balanced amount, in small amounts, not in an overgrowth. So this is the key thing, which when I'm talking to my colleagues to try to get them to understand. Now, of course, when you have a patient that has HIV, AIDS, uh, or someone who's been on chemotherapy, their, their immune system is suppressed, so the candida that's there starts to proliferate, and that's why we see in those patients, you know, what's called thrush on their tongue and, and certain kind of, you know, fungal skin rashes. But what about somebody who is, quote, immune competent? Probably everybody in this room. Why would somebody in this room develop candida? Well, there are a lot of risk factors that I see every day in my practice that patients have been taking these medications that have made them more prone to candida overgrowth. 
One of the first things is antibiotics. Now, unfortunately, uh, it's starting, you know, for years, people didn't understand the impact taking antibiotics has on our health. And unfortunately, many patients have been on antibiotics for recurrent respiratory infections. Um, I see frequently, again, patients, young patients I see in my office that have been on for acne, a year or two of, of tetracycline or doxycycline, um, for Lyme disease. So a whole host of conditions, you know, patients are being treated with, not to say the least, you know, we got into our food supply because they were feeding the animals antibiotics. The other thing which is overlooked and not realized a lot of times is acid blockers. Uh, the pepsids, the Zantax, uh, the Prilosex, the uh, Nexiums, all of these acid blockers which um, in fact uh, make the pH in the stomach too alkaline so that the yeast can overgrow. So again, this predisposes patients to the candida overgrowth. The birth control pill, again, which many women have been on for various reasons, um, again, with the high estrogen can promote the yeast overgrowth. Um, as well as corticosteroids, which are used in asthma frequently and even in inhaled medications. Um, and we're going to get to in a little bit more depth about the high refined carbohydrate diet, which again now everybody knows is the enemy, but for many years it was fat was considered the enemy. So this has all changed. And I think again too, why have our, your doctors again not believed candida overgrowth exists? Because, and I can understand this, so many of them are prescribing all of these medications. How could you, you know, in good conscience, be prescribing all these medicines and at the same time accept that it's causing this other condition? Mm -hmm. So that, that's my revelation on all this. I want to talk about the stages of candida. This is something actually that I came up with because again, seeing so many patients in my practice that present in different ways, and it goes back to again, all these multiple symptoms. Um, stage one, is what I call the intestinal symptoms. This is what people start to feel the, the gastric symptoms, the bloating, the gas, reflux, constipation. Uh, things that sometimes people think is, quote, normal. You know, they say, oh, I just gotta live with this. I'll get the Rolaids, I'll take the Tums. But it's not normal. And uh, unfortunately, I don't see a lot of patients in stage one that typically self-treating themselves or they go into the gastroenterologist and get an endoscopies, colonoscopies, any scopy you know, to try to figure out what the problem is, but the gastroenterologist turns to them and says, I don't see anything wrong with you. Stage two, what I see, and this has to do with the leaky gut, is when you get extra intestinal symptoms, meaning outside the intestinal tract. And what happens is the yeast likes to go to particular areas. It likes the vaginal area in women. So that's why I see women who've been treated multiple times for a chronic yeast infection by the gynecologist, but they're not better because they didn't get at the root cause. I also see a lot of patients that have chronic sinus infections. These are patients that have been treated with multiple courses of antibiotics, thinking that it was bacterial, and as a result, the yeast overgrows there. Very interestingly, I tell patients, when I was in medical school, they used to, in our histology course, when they were giving us a test, they used to put the, the vaginal slide and the sinus slide on the, you know, on the same microscope to try to differentiate, but they're very similar. Um, also the skin, again, I would call it a stage two. I get a lot of patients that get fungal skin rashes. I also see a lot of patients with, with what's called urticaria or hives that we help cure once we treat the underlying yeast overgrowth. The third stage, which again, doctors hate, but I think it's becoming more and more accepted, is the neuropsychiatric symptoms that are, come with this, which again, it's hard to believe, but we know this exists in celiac disease too, where, you know, again, Dr. Pisano talks all the time about these patients having brain fog, not concentrating well. Again, these are things that doctors don't like to hear, but you really have to listen to your patients. And so again, the poor concentration of memory, it's a big issue with, with patients that I'm seeing who are typically at least in stage three. In stage four, again, comes the muscle symptoms. And this is where I see patients that have had chronic fatigue and they can actually even get muscle pain syndromes, you know, such as fibromyalgia. So how do we test the candida? Well, for a long time, and even maybe still today, people think it really isn't a good test. And again, that's something doctors don't like. And patients are frustrated. They'll come to me, how do I know I have candida? You know, and I'll tell them, I hope they listen, that obviously the history is extremely important, but they also usually want something beyond that. So what are the different tests for candida? Well, if you go on the internet, you'll hear about the spit test. I've actually never done it, you know, but I've, I've seen pictures of it, something where the saliva doesn't go 
down as much? I don't know. It doesn't seem that scientific to me. Some people swear by it. I don't use it as one of my medical tests to diagnose candida. Stool testing. Stool testing could be good for a lot of things. I think it's still evolving. You may find candida in the stool. Obviously, it's very heavy. You may not. I mean, there's supposed to be some there anyway in some cases. So again, for me, it's not the most valuable test. Blood testing, again, I just did a podcast, which I'll tell people about at the end, where I interviewed a researcher on candida who thought there were many articles that show candida immunoglobulin um, testing, like for IgG and IgA, are very helpful in the diagnosis. Again, I haven't had that experience. It also, in some states, like in New York for a while, you weren't allowed to do that test at all because there was so much controversy about it. So I ended up going back to my toolbox, which is allergy and immunology, and I use a skin test, which I have found to be extremely helpful in diagnosing patients that I think have candida overgrowth and hypersensitivity. We put the, uh, the, the skin test, it's from an allergen extract of candida under the skin, and we wait about 10 minutes. If a patient has a very intense reaction immediately, that tends to indicate that there's candida overgrowth. Um, in a the perfect person, which I don't see quite often, there should be no immediate reaction. In the perfect person, 48 hours later, they should have a reaction because we all have candida in our body. So that's the differentiation. And of course, unfortunately, in an AIDS patient, I would not see an immediate reaction. And 48 eight hours later, I would not see uh, a delayed reaction, meaning that they were extremely immune suppressed. So that's how I use this test to help in some way confirm that I think candida is an issue for a particular patient. So what's the treatment for candida? Well, it, it involves a combination of the diet, which we'll talk about, and I know there's been a lot of controversy about that over the years. It involves medications, it can involve supplements, and it can involve something called immunotherapy. But again, it's really the key thing is getting at the underlying cause, restoring the balance in the body. This is the candida diet. It's very famous. It's gotten a lot of negative things over the years. Um, the funny thing for me though today is that fortunately in my lifetime, the Canada diet went from being a curse to being cool. <laughs> a lot of my patients that I see, some of them celebrities, not all of them, but some of them and some of the actors or actresses or athletes, they're all following some variation of this diet. Why? Because again, the literature seems to be pointing to that it's anti-inflammatory and the byproduct is it helps you lose weight and stay thin. So, um, Many of them are following, so no, I no longer have this, these tears coming out of people's eyes when I had to say to them, we gotta get rid of the bread, we should get rid of the sugar, we should get rid of the cheese and uh, milk, and of course the alcohol. And again, this could be for a time limited period, but uh, most people are a lot more accepting of this now, and it makes sense, and there are a lot more choices now for them to, to decide. Okay, so let's move on to medications. This is something important that I think I'm able to do as a medical doctor that you can't get from a, whole, uh, from a health food store, even though there's some very good people in those places trying to help patients. Um, but when I use antifungal medications, I can quickly restore the balance in the immune system. And uh, things like Diflucan or Nystatin can be done very safely and make a huge difference. Uh, one of the people, again, I just interviewed, Dr. Marjorie Fandel said, you can't cure candida with diet alone. And I've seen that. I've seen people get a little bit better, but I can see how frustrated they are not to get fully better. Certain herbs like molybdenum, garlic, they're all helpful, but they tend to help patients more when they're better already. Probiotics also tend to help patients when they're better already. Sublingual immunotherapy. This is something that's my expertise. I've treated thousands of patients over the last 20 years for environmental allergies with sublingual immunotherapy and gotten them better. I have now started my practice, I'm really excited, we've been using sublingual immunotherapy to uh, reverse and prevent severe food allergies, like people that are highly allergic to peanut, tree nuts, and shellfish. Again, a game changer for these people's lives. Uh, we've also used sublingual therapy for candida, you know, with some good success so patients can extend, um, can uh, expand their diet and uh, it helps them you know, long term wise. My last slide is just that I think the future is really exciting. I mean, I think candida is the example of a microbiome disease that's gonna be cured. I think there'll be a lot more of them. 
If you get a chance, I'd love for you guys to go to uh, my podcast, The Smartest Doctor in the Room. We're interviewing the top people in the country about so many uh, interesting, holistic topics um, that I think I'm going to love. Thank you so much.